my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar good evening to all here in bangladesh and a very good afternoon to all those who are watching this program live from germany so hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic today uh, is our 127 international physics webinar so i think you have already come to know that uh, our department department of physics pabna university of science and technology has started its online program including online uh, classes and online international physics webinar we have successfully completed our 126 international physics webinar so we are trying to adjust with this new normal situation so today is very important day for our department today i'd like to welcome you all to a, through a joint session between the department of physics pabna university of science and technology and the technical university of munich munich german in physics and we have with us here today dr jonas uh, jo, uh, noel uh, professor technical university of munich uh, munich germany and he has already connected uh, with us so sir uh, uh, good afternoon and good good evening to here so welcome to our international physics webinar and thanks for accepting our invitation so i think you are too busy with your uh, research work but still you are uh, accepting and uh, our invitation and giving us time thanks for uh, everything so for those who are new uh, i'd like to introduce that uh, we have divided our webinar into three parts first of all we'd like to uh, in introduce our speaker with all of you and then our speaker will deliver his piece and at the end we have a discussion time in that time anybody join with us so i think you have already come to know the uh, title of this today's international physics uh, material is new particles in the old materials hunting majorana fermions and the quantum spin liquids and our speaker it a speaker is dr jonahans uh, noel sir professor technical university munich munich germany so you can see his uh, professional and educational and his experience so Pro professor noel's area of expertise is the condensed matter system in resumes of in in which the uh, laws of quantum mechanics are important in condensed matter physics complex behavior arises from the interaction of a large number of basic degrees of freedom the objective of his research is to uncover his, the richness of the fascinating behavior and to understand the universal principle that organize the physical world noel's research is focused on the search for unconventional quantum phases in correlated materials uh, which does not only lead to a deeper understanding of the fundamental principle driving these phases but has also practical relevance for future quantum technology professor noel studied physics at the technical university dresden and boston university he completed his phd at max planck institute of, for physics of complex system in 2014 after a postdoctoral position at the university of cambridge he joined imperial college london as a lecturer in 2017 in 2019 he was appointed as an associate professorship at tum technical university of munich so you can see uh, his uh, awards and this is his uh, key publication so thanks for all of your patience now it's time to go to our speaker sir uh, i'd like to welcome you again it's save time sir you can start your session sir okay thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction um and um yeah also for putting together this uh, really nice series um that uh, you know makes it all easier for all of us around the world um to uh, to cope with uh you know the pandemic and everything so at the moment i you know i can't see um anybody but you know if there are questions um yeah so then um type them in the chat or save them yeah. for the discussion afterwards or if there's something urgent i guess you can also um um shout in yeah for example if you don't understand anything or if there's a technical problem please just um yeah let me know and shout in okay good so um i'm talking to about uh, today about um want to give you an overview talk about um this uh field of um frustrated magnetism where we have exotic phases called quantum spin liquids in particular in particular i want to highlight you know that within this condensed matter context we can actually uh also have new mater uh, material uh, particles and the interesting thing is that you know some of these new exotic quantum particles are hiding in some rather old uh, materials which we have used for for many many decades so um let me start with a really broad introduction to set the stage and also you know i um uh, guess you have a pretty heterogeneous background so what you know this whole talk is concerned with 
is uh, the question, you know, what is the main nature of matter? And, you know, that's a really old question. And here I've chosen like a, a picture from Iceland where you have this geyser and you just see that um, water, for example, can be in many different forms, can be liquid, can be vapor, can be in ice. And it was uh, Democritus who already, you know, well over 2000 years ago conjectured that all the different forms that we see around us are basically just uh, um, due to the different arrangement of tiny uh, called atoms, which just um, are themselves very simple. But since we have a huge number of them, um, they can actually rearrange in different forms. And that would explain all the different forms that we see around us. So that's something already, you know, a fundamental idea, pretty close to what we understand today in terms of condensed matter physics. Um, but, you know, in addition to understanding what nature gives us, there is also a new element which uh, will come uh, later also in this talk. And this is not only understanding what is there, but also creating new phases. And this is an idea This uh, was uh, very popular, introduced by the alchemists of the Middle Ages, who, for example, wanted to turn sulfur into gold, um, which um, obviously wasn't very successful. But the key idea is, and that happens um, you know, very often also today in research, is that you're trying to do one thing which doesn't work out, like turning you know, sulfur into gold, but you discover actually other things uh, which are very interesting. For example, in the process of trying to turn uh, sulfur into gold, one of these alchemists, um, uh, Böttcher, who is um, from the place where I was born and studied in, uh, in Saxony, uh, in um, the middle of Germany. So he actually rediscovered porcelain uh, for Europe, and that was an important contribution there. So, you know, actually creating new phases is something that is long around us. But of course, nowadays we're interested in new quantum phases. And here are a few paradigmatic examples that I want to show you. So things like superconductivity and Bose-Einstein condensation. But today I want to focus on magnets and want to highlight two different kinds of magnets, um, which you all have seen. Namely, the first one would be ferromagnets, where you just have, for example, a regular lattice of uh, spins. You can just think of little bar magnets and they can all point in the same direction and it gives a net magnetic moment. And this, you know, humankind has used for thousands and thousands of years, for example, in compass needles. But then there is a more subtle uh, feature of this long range order magnet. And this is a state called an antiferromagnet or like a nail state, where now you have a very regular arrangement of up and down spins. And the point is now you don't have a net magnetic moment. And it turns out that in the beginning and mid 20th century um, physics research, you know, there was a big de debate whether these nail states exist. And one of the complications is precisely that, you know, it doesn't have a net magnetic moment. So you have to do something more subtle in terms of experiment to actually find it. Okay. And I will come back to this. And, you know, this idea that we have new phases of matter. And the question is, how do you actually find out about it? How do you see it experimentally? This is one question that, um, you know, I will discuss um, in, in this talk today. Good. So then here's the outline. I will. You know, start with this motivation, and then I want to spend some time to explain to you what a spin liquid is, um, why these are interesting, um, that they are long range entangled, and show something really unintuitive, which is called fractionalization. And then I show you a particular example, and then um, you know, lots of calculations that we did. I mean, just um, basically the summary of those, and then comparison to experiments. So. Again, let's let's recap what we know uh, in modern condensed matter physics, namely that we have complexity, um, which arises from the interaction of a huge number of particles. And you know these particles, usually just electrons in a solid, um, you know they are themselves very simple. But nevertheless, because they have a large number, they interact. They can give rise to new phases. And the interesting bit is, of course, that new phases they can serve as new vacua out of which new quasi particles arise. And this is what we want to want to understand and in that sense this is different so these new particles within these materials this is different from what um, you might be used to in high energy physics so for example here i have a picture of um, the lhc uh, on the border between switzerland and france um, and the point is that you know there everything uh, so you have to excite high energy <clears throat> collisions to see new particles. And instead, what we will do is we actually take materials and we cool them down to very, very low temperatures. And there we can have new uh, emergent particles. But nevertheless, the formalism to describe those, and a lot of times um, also the, uh, the type of particles we will find can actually be very similar um, 
to the ones that are discussed in high energy physics. And the really interesting thing is like, even those we will find some exotic particles, they can actually be hidden in old materials. So for example, I show you lot, lots of results on this um, material alpha retained trichloride, which you know you can just go on the internet, that's from a few years ago, uh, and you can just Google it and you can just order it commercially, um, because for many, many decades, it's used as a catalyst. But people just had never thought that if you cool it down to low temperatures, it might have very interesting uh, properties, uh, which we're just trying to understand in the last few years. Good, so then let me remind you uh, a little bit about the standard theory of how new phases arise and new particles arise. And then, um, you know, it's easier to appreciate um, what is new about these quantum phases that um, are of current research interest. So we all, you know, might have heard that one of the standard way of describing phase transition is via order parameters and landau ginzburg theory. And there in particular, if we break uh, spontaneous symmetry, uh, or if, you, if we have spontaneous symmetry breaking of continuous symmetries, we get what's called Goldstone bosons. And um, then you can ask, like, how do you actually know that's true? And the basic example um, is that, for example, of phonons. So think of you have um, um, a gas of two different types of um, atoms or ions. And at high temperature, you know, they are all randomly distributed. But because of the interaction, if you cool them to low temperatures, you will actually see, oh, sorry. Um, share. So, no, sorry. Sorry, Maybe I, I, clicked, I clicked on the wrong thing. I'm yeah, sorry. It's okay. uh, now I should be should be back again, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, so then um, at low temperatures, you will crystallize in this very regular crystal lattice. And then um, you can think now of the excitations as just being little strings that are between these uh, different two different ions. And you also see what the symmetry breaking is, namely that before that, everything is random. If you look left and right, everything in the world looks the same. But now you have crystallized in this regular arrangement where depending whether you sit on this blue atom, the world around you looks different than if you sit on this green atom. So you have broken the continuous translation symmetry of the system. And now the excitations are, you know, just thinking of little springs and then you um, excite one of those. And that would mean that you get what's called phonons. And you know, for example, that you have these acoustic phonon branches and these can measure an experiment. For example, in neutron scattering, you would see these nice linearly dispersing modes. And that's how people, for example, uh, know that this is true. Now we're interested in magnets here. So same thing happens at high temperatures. Just think of a lattice where you can have spins that can rotate uh, in three directions. And at high temperatures, this is just a gas, uh, just random. So there is a full, what's called spin rotation symmetry. And then because of the interaction, you would crystallize, for example, this regular up, down, up, down pattern. And now um, the excitations that you get are what's called uh, magnons or spin waves. And then out of this ordering wave factor that you see here, you will see again linear modes. So this is momentum versus energy. So you just get a dispersion relation, which is um, you know a linear um, relation between energy and momentum. And this you can also see in neutron scattering. In fact, this is directly a structure factor from neutron scattering calculated. Now, um, in the 70s, basically, people thought that they had understood phases and how these excitations, Goldstone bosons are generated. And then the question is, of course, is that really all there is? And usually when you try to, uh, when, you, when you think you've understood something exhaustively, then, you know, um, uh, nature can have many surprises, it's richer than we can anticipate. And the first glimpse of that was given in 1971 by Franz Wegener, who wrote down simple lattice gauge theories to show that you can actually have phases with phase, thermal phase transitions, but without symmetry breaking. And so this was the beginning, which then culminated also in things like the costellet staulis phase transition of um, you know, these new quantum phases where topology plays a prominent role. And here I'm interested in these phases where you will never go to a long range ordered state, but quantum fluctuations are so strong that we go to a new state, which is called a spin liquid, which I will explain. And um, the question that I want to address here, and the question that is a big research topic, that um, I have worked on and want to present to you is how to actually look for these new phases in experiment. So what would be the analog of these um, scattering experiments? So that brings me to the particular type of phase um, that 
I want to talk about. These are quantum spin liquids. And let me tell you the basic ingredients that we need to, to build spin liquid. So the basic ingredients is just the property of the electron. And you know, the electron is just a mass and a charge and a spin. And here we will only be interested really in the spin component. In particular, what I'm talking about is mostly mod insulators. So think of that you just have one electron per site and they can't move around. Um, so they are not metallic, um, but it's just the, the um, spin degree of freedom that is relevant here. So then the other thing is, of course, what we need is quantum mechanics, in particular, uh, superposition that, um, you know, a spin can be in two different states. And you have all seen this uh, famous example of the Schrodinger cat. But we want to look at the many particle system where the other key ingredient is, of course, that we want entanglement. So entanglement that you, for example, can take two spins half and put them into this spin singlet. And that would basically be um, a probably a property of the global state. And the reason why, you know, people are interested so much in entanglement is not only because it's, you know, philosophically interesting and weird, but also because in, if you think in terms of um, doing information processing, then classically you only have two bits of up and down, but in quantum mechanics, you can basically put the information into the amplitude of the wave functions. And that of course is um, a continuous um, variable here. And um, that uh, means we can do, hopefully in some future, much more efficient, more powerful information processing with that. But of course, the big foe of this is that these <clears throat> entanglement, where we, for example, can encode these informations, is fragile due to decoherent coupling to the environment. And that would basically erase um, the information that we want to that we want to manipulate. And so one of the, one of the uh, ways of um, going around this, because you know, it's really hard to isolate a many-body quantum system from the environment. So one of the big questions, how to get robust long-range entanglement. And one of the exciting things is that we can actually encode this long-range uh, robust entanglement in a stable uh, quantum phase of matter. OK? And so how does that go? Um, so um, that brings me to now magnetic materials. So usually you are, uh, um, you, you have seen um, standard ordered magnets, but here the, the realm where quantum spin liquids is, appear is so-called frustrated magnets. And these are, just think of, for example, a simple easing model where you want to anti-align nearest neighbor spins, and then it's frustrated because no matter how you point this spin, it will be happy with either one of the spins that you've already put there. So frustrated magnet is one where you can't satisfy the local um, interaction simultaneously um, for all bonds here, for example. And then it was Phil Anderson who um, conjectured over uh, uh, five decades ago that um, when we cool this down to low temperatures, we go into a new state and it's now a state of interacting spins, but it doesn't show any long range order and doesn't break any rotational or translational sy symmetries. So that's that's a rather negative definition um, and might sound that you know not much interesting is going on. But the key thing is that just in the last one or two decades, we have learned how to characterize quantum spin liquids in a positive way. And the first thing that is good to have in mind is like a, um, how this current state looks like. And there is this famous proposal of a, a resonating valence bond wave function, namely that the ground state of such a quantum spin liquid would be an equal weight superposition of all possible dimer coverings, and each dimer would be such a um, nearest neighbor spin singlet. And you know this idea has been around very long um, uh, of this RVB wave function, but it took even many decades until 2000 until a microscopic Hamiltonian was found which realizes such an RVB phase. So you see this whole field deals with strongly interacting quantum many body systems. So it's generically something hard where, you know, even how to treat it theoretically um, is not at all clear. So how can you see that this is long range entangled? So um, it's resonating valence bond because within this restricted fully packed um, dimer covering, you only have very few allowed um, kinetic re resonances that you can do. So we can, you can um, take, um, for example, these two dimers here, which are parallel, and you can just flip them by 120 degree here, such that they would point, uh, would point here. 
Okay, and so these are the only low energy fluctuations which are allowed. And now you see that the ground state actually um, falls into different sectors. Namely, you can put this system on a torus, just think of periodic boundary conditions in two different directions. And then you can just take a fictitious line, so that's the red one, and just count the number of dimers that um, cross that line. And now the key thing is that the parity of the number of dimers crossing that line is conserved and can't be changed. So, for example, here you have two dimers. If you want to now have a resonance and rotate them by 120 degrees, you would put here. So you change the number of dimers crossing that line by two, and the parity is the same. And so that is a, clo a global parity, and that is um, an example of what's called a topological invariant, and that is also a way how you can, in a clo global prop property, store quantum information. And that's why people are so much interested in this, because that might be a way of um, having a system which is robust to local perturbation that can then be used, for example, for topological uh, quantum information process. But here, um, I don't want to go into too much detail to that, but I want to just tell you that just like we've seen before that breaking different symmetries gives you different Goldstone modes, also here having a new phase usually comes with new excitations and they are very special and uh, they are special because they are what's called fractional excitations. And um, fractional excitations are well known in the context of the fractional quantum wall effect, where we have a system, like a two-dimensional electron gas, which only consists of electron, but nevertheless, if you put it in a strong magnetic field, we have excitations, which you can measure in experiment, um, within the material, which only carry one-third of the electron charge. And that is, of course, weird, because we know the electron is an elementary particle, um, uh, point like particle with the charge E, which you can't split. But within the material, we have these new quasi particles which have fractional numbers. So the same would be here in these um, magnetic insulators. You can take one of those singlets and actually make a triplet ex excitation. And then that gives you two spin one. That's a spin one excitation. So that's the only excitations that you're allowed to do in these magnetic insulators, just spin flips. But now the key thing is that this one spin one excitation can be separated into two independent spin one half excitations, which are what's called deconfined. So you can really think of them individually. And then you have a charged neutral spin one half excitation, which, for example, violates the spin statistics theorem. And in that sense, they are also fractionalized. And the interesting bit is they can have weird statistics, for example, anionic statistics between bosons and fermions, which are again a building block for. Um, topological quantum information processing. But, you know, this is all good and nice and a great theorist's um, dream and playground, but the question is really like, you know, is that true? Can we have that in actual materials? And this brings me to this big question, and this is, you know, how to look for quantum spin liquids. So they have all these really nice, amazing properties, very exotic, they have been predicted for many, many decades, but um, the key thing is up to date, and, you know, that's maybe changing the in the, in the last years, is that we don't really have unambiguous uh, material candidates for that. So we have a lot of indications, but you know the community wouldn't agree that you know this is the spin liquid. So the point why this is so difficult is related to this question: how to look for one. So if I give you a material, how would you actually know it's a spin liquid? And the method of choice in these magnetic insulators is inelastic neutron scattering where you do a scattering experiment where you have your sample and you shoot in a neutron with a momentum and an energy, and then you measure the outgoing neutron uh, and the shift in energy and momentum. And if you know it interacts just with a simple S dot S interaction and uses a spin flip in your uh, material, and so then if you have an excitation within the system, for example, a simple magnum in a conventionally long-range ordered magnet, then you will just have a sharp dispersion corresponding to this uh, to this excitation. So that's here, for example, some all the work we did on iron-based superconductors, and this is energy versus momentum. And the color coding is really the cross-section of the neutron scattering experiments. And the black dots, by the way, are experiments for that. So, you know, that would be in a non-fractionalized system. But here I showed, uh, told you that for quantum spin liquids, um, we have fractionalization, which means that a simple spin one excitation now decays into, for example, two spin one half spin on excitations. And then by energy momentum conservation, you actually realize that there is now only a broad continuum that you can see and no sharp dispersion. 
And that is until a few years back or 10 years back by now, um, that was the gold standard of you know, a neutron scattering experiment. There are several more, I will show you some more later. But the main answer is that it's just a very broad diff diffuses, diffusive um, response. So it's very hard to make really um, conclusive um, um, statements about um, um, experiments like this. Okay, so that's one of the reasons it's difficult to probe spin liquids um, experimentally. Well, basically, because we have a lack of um, experimental signatures because there's no long range order, there are no new Bragg peaks, and also um, because um, the quantum number fractionalization means that we always have to excite the fractionalized particles in um, you know pairs or multiples of these. Now, um, one area where there has been a lot of progress are one-dimensional spin chain compounds, where um, we have special methods um, for theory to calculate them, because again, we have strongly interacting phases, but we know um, from what's called the beta ansatz how to um, calculate, for example, structure factors. And this is a calculation for the one-dimensional spin chain compound described by um, basically a generalized Heisenberg model, Heisenberg chain, and these are neutron scattering data. And what you see there is that you have this large continuum in the calculations and the data. And you see there that um, you have this continuum and you have very, very good agreement, uh, which establishes that in one dimension, which is very special, we actually have this, um, this fractionalization indeed occurring. Now, the problem is that beyond one dimension, um, things get much more messy because we don't have things like the beta ansatz and one is usually left with, from the theoretical side, doing uncontrolled approximations, mean field theories, or pure numerics, which are really limited in system size and what you can calculate. And so in general, we know that a strongly interacting quantum phase beyond one dimension is in general a hard thing to deal with. Um, that's, for example, the problem of um, copper high temperature superconductors. And um, one of the things that um, we did over the last 10 years is to provide exact calculations for these dynamical correlation functions for two dimensions. And also later on, we did also for three dimensional quantum spin liquids. So this is, can then be compared to experiment, but it can also use to benchmark uh, numerics, for example. Right, so what's the trick? How you, know, you can overcome this problem to treat um, strongly interacting systems and this, um, is done by treating a special model. Um, and um, this has really you know, put a lot of um, um, research interest into this whole field and it's called the Kitaev model. Um, so before I tell you the exact results of the scattering experiments and what we predicted there, I will introduce the model and tell you why it's special because you directly see how these um, special excitations can arise. So the nice thing of this Kitaev model introduced in 2006 by Alexei Kitaev is that it's really simple, okay? So for those of you who have seen mathematical models of soluble systems, they might be usually horribly complicated in terms of projectors or so on. So the nice thing is that the model is really just an easing model on the honeycomb lattice, okay? So it's a honeycomb lattice. And the only thing that is the special ingredient is that you have three inequivalent bond directions, the one which you call a Z bond and all ones parallel to this here, colored in green. And then you call this one the um, Y bonds and these ones the X bonds. And now you just have an easing interaction and the changes, the quantization of the easing interaction changes from bond to bond. So here along this bond, you have a sigma Z, sigma Z interaction, and then along this one, a sigma X, sigma X. And you see that it's frustrated because you can't align a spin at a given vertex in three or four directions. Now, the reason why it's exactly soluble is that you have what's called the large number of degrees of freedom. And these are these flux operators. So you can just take a product of these complicated spin <coughs> arrangement around a plaquette. And this is actually conserved on the, uh, under the dynamics. So it commutes with the Hamiltonian. And so this is uh, one of the ingredients to solve it exactly. But that exhausts all the possibilities that only has block diagonalized to Hamiltonian to different sectors. But then the remaining degrees of freedom, and that's the amazing thing, are um, simple Majorana fermions. And these Majorana fermions are, of course, known since the 30s, um, which were predicted there as um, real solutions to the Dirac equation. And in that sense, these are also their own um, um, antiparticle. Right. 
Good, but the key thing is here, they really emerge as low energy quasi particles um, with weird statistics in this simple spin model on the honeycomb lattice. So let me also tell you briefly how you actually solve the model. Um, so you know that if you write down a spin one half, so the only thing that defines this is really the commutation relation, and you can rewrite a spin one half like this Pauli matrix in terms of four Majorana fermions, which just anti-commute with each other, and squared one instead of zero. And so you have four of these, so three with a label for the spin directions, and one which we call a meta Majorana without anyone. And this really um, is a good representation, and it directly gives you the Pauli spin algebra with some constraint. And then you can just take the Hamiltonian from the previous slide, rewrite it in this term, and you've already seen that I've taken two of these Majorana fermions with a label from two different um, sites along this bond and put them into this link variable. And now the amazing thing is that this link variable is also conserved. So it commutes with this Hamiltonian and it can only have eigenvalues plus and minus one, just like our flux operator only has eigenvalues plus and minus one. And the key thing is that the product of these link variables U around a plaquette exactly gives the flux operator. So now what you can do is you can just fix these numbers, these fluxes, and we know from um, a theorem, which is called Leap's theorem, that the ground state must be flux three. For example, you can put all the u's to plus one, and then you just have a quadratic problem which you can solve, not in terms of fermions, which would give you on the honeycomb lattice the usual Dirac spectrum of um, graphene, so two-dimensional carbon. But here our Cs are Majorana fermions, and the only difference is that we only get the positive energies branch, but we still get these Dirac um, Majorana fermion excitations here. Okay, so that was you know a two-minute crash course how you can uh, find an exact solution to the system. Right, so that gives only ground state properties, but you know by the time we looked at this, there were already hundreds and hundreds of works on this model, but nobody had studied the most obvious correlation function, and that's basically what you need to do when you make predictions for um, scattering experiments. Now, um, as I said, this model was um, really important because it was the, one of the first really soluble models, but the whole field really took off when in 2009, um, George Jacelli and Ginyat Khalilian predicted that they're actually materials which can be described by the Kitaev model um, at low temperatures. And by now, over the last, uh, well, it's now more than a decade, there's now a whole range of different materials. There are many different um, candidates, and the most prominent one at the moment is this alpha retinium trichloride. Right, and so that's one of the um, big you know, research branches at the moment that there are many groups, you know, trying to really see how much of Kitai physics is within these candidate materials. But I still haven't told you what the spin liquid looks like, what the Kitai spin liquid looks like um, in uh, these neutron scattering experiments, for example. Right, so what you would probe there is, um, so you can just open a textbook and it will tell you that the cross-section of a neutron scattering experiment will probe the structure factor, which is nothing but the Fourier transformation in space and time of the spin-spin correlation function. And now, because of the spin fractionalization, um, when we act with a spin operator, we will not only create simple Majoranas, but we will actually create a flux pair and these Majoranas, because of fractionalization, they always have to come in multiple um, <clears throat> in multiples, these fractionalized excitations. And here's a cartoon picture. So you would shoot in a neutron, it would flip the spin, and at the same time, if you start without fluxes, that would be all the pluses, you would introduce now a flux pair and also a lot of Majoranas. And here is a picture at different stroboscopic times, um, how then the Majorana wave function looks like. Good. And how do we calculate that? I'll tell you in a second, but let me first show you the, uh, the result. So that is now a neutron scattering cross-section prediction um, so this is frequency versus momentum, some path in the Brayon zone, and the color coding would be the intensity. And as you know, we expected for a system which doesn't have any order, the, the main thing to see is that it's very broad. Okay, So you would again, at first sight, think that it's extremely hard to make conclusive um, statements if you see something like this. But fortunately, if you look as a function of energy, and there is something really sharp happening, namely there's a gap at low frequencies, and this gap is precisely 
the energy it costs to create a flux pair. And then the rest of the spectrum as a function of energy corresponds to properties of the Majorana fermion density of states. So for those of you who have seen graphene, so you know there's this famous um, Van Hoof singularity, so that gives you here a minimum, uh, and you see the whole bandwidth um, at 6 um, JZ as well, which corresponds to the Majorana hopping bandwidth um, on the honeycomb lattice. And here's just a cartoon picture of, you know, what you can keep in mind. So the upshot is that if you look at some of these fine features, especially as a function of frequency, you can actually have real strong signatures of fractalization that you can um, um, compare to experiments. So when we did this calculation, um, we weren't aware that um, people had or were at the moment also doing the experiments, but then we were contacted by people from Oak Ridge National Lab who had now done neutron scattering experiments on this powder of alpha rutium trichloride. So this is the data of actual um, experiments. So this is now a powder, which means you only have access to the absolute value of the momentum. And um, I will not spend you know, too much time to convince you that the left picture, which is our prediction, looks you know, very much like the right picture. But you know, there are strong arguments in favor of that. And uh, in hindsight, it was really one of the first signatures that one has this broad continuum at high energy, uh, higher frequencies here, which also doesn't change much as a function of temperature, which were um, you know, thought to, to be first signatures of these magnetic Majorana fermions. And since 2016, there's now more and more evidence. So um, subsequently, the um, group around um, Steve Nagler from Oak Ridge, they managed to also grow large single crystals and did new neutron scattering. So this is now at a fixed frequency as a full resolution of momenta. And this is the prediction um, for the Kitaev model that we had done. And you can you know, go in much more detail. And the main point is that now we have um, much and much, you know, mounting evidence that we really have these quantum spin liquid properties in this material, um, which are most crisply interpreted in terms of these Mojana fermions. Right, so um, there is, yeah, and, you know, I told you all these amazing properties of the spin liquids and these fractionalized particles in the beginning, but um, you should always keep in mind that if you want to do quantum information processing, you are thinking of doing you know, manipulating these. And for that, you, of course, first need to really understand them and control them. But at this point, we're really at the stage of first confirming that they actually exist uh, in, in nature. So that's, that's basically the status um, that we are at the moment. But we are currently thinking about how really you would, for example, also manipulate them in a controlled fashion. Then since there are a lot of, um, you know, students in the audience, who might not really know what actually um, goes into this in terms of research. So what, as a theoretical physicist, I'm actually doing the whole day. Um, so I have put in this small slide to just give you a flavor of that. And in particular, I haven't really told you what goes into calculating um, the structure factor that um, I have shown you. And one can show that in the end, you can reduce the whole problem you know, as expected to some mathematical equation, which is um, taking here the form of some Dyson equation for some propagator. Uh, propagator. And um, what it basically is, is that we spend uh, a lot of time, in particular for this problem, we just spend, you know, on trying to solve this singular integral equation. Um, and this was um, really keeping us busy for, yeah, several months, if not a year. And um, the, the nice thing, that um, you realize from that is that sometimes, you know, if you try to do brute force things and just, for example, put the whole integral equation, I mean, the, and it just has a single argument. So you might think, let's just put it on a, on a computer and just solve it. But, um, and this, of course, we tried. And you realize this, this actually doesn't always work. It's particularly if you have a single integral equation with a singular kernel. So then, you know, you had to, think much harder and this really took the most of the time. That's where you spend your weeks, um, how to deal with singular integral equation. And in the end, we found um, some nice mathematical theory. Um, it's called the Muskelishvili method of a Georgian uh, mathematician that allowed us to take our singular integral equation, turn it into a non-singular one that we can then solve numerically. Um, and um, that really 
uh, is something that goes into into solving um, these structure factors. And but the upshot is that for the first time we really were able to calculate these dynamical correlation functions in the thermodynamic limit for these um, two-dimensional strongly interacting quantum spin liquids. Good. So that was just to give you a flavor of you know how do you actually get these um, these pictures and how do we actually spend our time as theoretical physicists. Now there is a little secret that I haven't told you about, but which is of course very important, namely that um, the system um, alpha tim trichloride, if you cool it down to low temperature, it actually has a magnetic transition and it shows a phase with long range magnetism. So this is actually not a pristine spin liquid phase. Um, and all the data I have shown you are for frequencies or especially for temperatures, which are just above that ordering transition. And so in a strict sense, we also know that um, the system is not a pristine spin liquid. And this um, led us to introduce this idea of approximate spin liquid. And the idea is there that um, you have a residual transition to long range magnetism. But if you look at elevated temperatures and frequencies, you don't really care about this and the system looks as if it would be a spin liquid. And this is, by the way, very similar to what you have in these spin chain compounds, where you know you have this amazing agreement between beta ansatz calculations and neutron scattering. But if you would look at very low frequencies, these are spin chain, three-dimensional spin chain materials which have weak interchain coupling. So they are also long-range ordered magnets, and um, they have very fine features of that. But if you're only interested in you know shorter time physics or at higher temperatures, then you know they look as if they would be pristine, um, disordered spin liquid chains. Now, this idea of having approximate spin liquid, this has now been turned over the last few years into um, um, an excellent working hypothesis. And there are many ways of showing um, um, supportive experiments for this. So one thing maybe to highlight is that we have a magnetic insulator and we could show it in the Raman scattering. You can even try to see whether we have um, fermionic distribution function instead of bosonic ones, so something like a, a Pauli exclusion principle, which is now emergent in the magnetic system. And in the last, um, um, you know, two to three years, there's also the idea that we can now melt this residual long, long range order of the approximate spin liquid to tune the system into a proper uh, spin liquid. And the most popular one is one where you now put a magnetic field. So there's an in-plane magnetic field. So we have these layer two-dimensional system. You apply an in-plane field, and then this residual, um, you know, annoying long-range order goes to zero. And the hope is that you know before you enter a trivial high-field polarized state, you go into a state with um, uh, hopefully spin-liquid correlations. And this is neutron scattering data, where first you see these weak signatures of spin waves. So these are conventional spin waves from the long range magnetism. And then around a Tesla, they're all gone and you just have this broad scattering continuum around the gamma point, which um, is again uh, an indication of these um, spin liquid features. Then um, a really um, amazing and in some sense puzzling experiment came um, in 2018. And it's related to prediction, which is already in the original um, paper of Alexei Kitaev, who showed that if you have, um, if you break time reversal symmetry, um, then you will gap out the Dirac spectrum of the Majorana fermions, and you will enter a phase which is equivalent to what's called the PX plus IPY superconductor. And in particular, you will get now um, um, a Hall effect, but you know we don't have any charge, so the only Hall effect that you can get here is the thermal Hall effect meaning that you apply a linear gradient in temperature and you will see the transversal to that direction, the temperature gradient will appear as well. And this has a universal um, slope, which is also quantized. And in particular, since we have Majorana fermions, it comes exactly with one half times the quantization that you would get for an electronic um, quantum hole system. And um, this one half, which is written here, um, it's important to show you that you have really Majorana fermions. In 2018, the group of um, Juji Matsuda, they claimed to measure this um, in um, a system of alpha rotating trichloride in the magnetic field. And that has caused a lot of excitement. It would be really the first time since the fractional quantum Hall effect that we see something fractionalized now in a quantum magnet. And, you know, look at the temperature scales. They're huge compared to 
um, scales when you see fractional quantum wall physics. Um, but there are many open questions and um, you know big debates of um, you know how robust that signal is and how we should interpret that and how it, for example, interacts with a formal background. But um, um, yeah, I just wanted to flash this as one of the key developments over the last years. Now then, let me let me come back and point out really uh, where we started from. So I told you that in the long run, really, we want to take the exotic fractionalized quasiparticles the topological order which these spin liquids show to hopefully learn to understand them, control them and manipulate them to have things like decoherence free quantum information technology. Um, there is of course the other really important question, namely what is possible in nature and you know the spin liquids are an example of a phase that has been predicted for many many decades but so far hasn't been conclusively seen but I showed you that there's many many um, evident, recent new evidence and strong indications. So that would be great that maybe in the not too distant future, we can also really claim that we have an unambiguous sighting of these exciting phases. And um, that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, and here is the summary. So the first thing is that I told you about Lando theory, how um, Goldstone modes there arise as excitations. And then I told you about these fractionalized spin liquids and in particular told you how Majorana fermions appear in these special Kitaev spin liquids, which have been so important for the field. And in particular, I showed you that if you have a sample, and here is this big single crystal, uh, which is you know macroscopically big for ethylchem trichloride, that in the end, the good news is you can just stick with your old neutron probes. So this is just good old neutron scattering that you also see to see phonon branches or uh, spin waves. But now here, by a close comparison between control theory predictions and these experiments, you know we, we see strong indications of these new um, excitations. And with this, um, let me thank you. And let me point out, if you're interested in the field, then um, there are two uh, reviews which we wrote um, recently. So the first one is really about Kitaev spin liquids, maybe a bit more technical, and summarizes a lot of work um, in the uh, in the field of the last decade. And then there's a broader, uh, more high-level conceptual review about this long, you know, you know, over 50-year-old journey to, to discover spin liquids um, in experiments and to understand them theoretically. And with this, let me thank you very much for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm happy, of course, to take questions. Sir, for your nice presentation. I think we have learned a lot of things about uh, this topic, the new particles of all materials. So if you allow, we can start discussion session. So mm -hmm. we've got a few questions in inbox. So, so should I stop the share sharing? No, you can, you can keep it, no problem. Okay, okay. So just uh, read it out. Sure. So the, what is the Landu paradigm? Sorry? Landu, para, Landu paradigm. Yeah, the Landau paradigm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first question is, what is that? Uh, maybe uh, maybe you, you have explained, but uh, he, he want to know that. Uh, could you explain it again? Yes. Okay. So the so the Landau paradigm is um, when you learn about um, in your undergraduate studies about phase transitions, then um, you know that you have this simple picture that you can expand the free energy um, as essentially a Taylor series in order parameters. So for example, think of just a simple magnetization. And then you know that um, you can write down um, an effective theory which describes the phase transition, which is equivalent to mean field treatment um, in terms of these uh, order parameters um, capturing the broken symmetries. Um, so you might have all seen you know, this double well potential where you know that um, below the critical temperature, you would spontaneously select one of the, the minima and above the critical temperature, you just have a single minima um, with your order parameter describing the disordered phase. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's the standard the standard way uh, how we you know describe nowadays uh, phase transitions and um, critical exponents, for example. Um, yeah, and this is you know the starting ground also for for then including fluctuations in terms of the randomization group. Okay, we have a guest with us, Raj Dash. If you have any question, you can ask. 
do you have any question can you hear with us if you have any question you can ask maybe you have uh, muted you have unmute please and thank okay. you very much uh, i am raj raj thank you yeah. uh, thanks to thanks give me opportunity to ask a question yeah 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 uh sorry uh, so thanks uh, for giving me opportunity to ask a questions so can i ask a questions uh, why uh, you are uh, you are saying about this quantum spin liquids and the major fermion so i am asking you a questions about fermions uh, by this process can you see uh, can you say uh, why the uh, fermions spin is non integer in generally how can we decide why the fermion spin is non integer okay yes so i mean here here these these fermions that we have so the majorana fermions which emerge this is this is something that you know doesn't carry any 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 spin anymore so you you really um um you know fractionalize your spin excitations on that level so i mean you know the spin statistics theorem which usually tells you that fermions need to come with half um half or the integer uh, spins and the reason why i mentioned that in terms of fractionalization is that we have new quasi particles for example if you have these spin ons which would still have a spin one half but the thing is they wouldn't have any charge so um but in terms of the fermions that i've presented here these majorana fermions you can really think about they don't have any extra degrees of freedom so you can really think of those as you know spinless in the sense of you know that they don't have any additional quantum number there yeah but of course they arise from the pauli spin algebra of some original degrees of freedom that you have um describing your system yeah i'm not sure whether that answers the question so but maybe 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 i also didn't fully understand what you wanted to have explained yeah maybe maybe you can repeat the question uh i am just uh, asking you a, a very basic questions about you you are uh, giving the talk i am uh, seeing your talks in facebook live but i am joining for this question where you are asking you are saying about the fermions so my basic question is if you see in bosons and fermions uh, most generally bosons have integers and fermions have non integers so why you are asking uh, you are saying about fermions so i am asking why this speciality what is the special reason of this uh, fermions uh, generally should have non integer spins uh, half 3 by 2 and 5 by 2 that's it oh why that is okay so you ask me about this well okay so you know that just comes out um if you write down um you know relativistic field theories you can within that you know prove something like the spin statistics theorem um which will you know which will tell you that this is the case yeah um i'm not sure whether i can say something yeah more general about this um so you know this is not part of you know my talk or some reason this is something you know that's known since you know uh many many decades um i guess in this you know 20s 30s um that yeah within relativistic field theory you you only have these relations for bosons and fermions yeah yeah, yeah if, you wanna, if you want to if you want to look into detail i mean just just look into any any book on quantum field theory about spin statistics theorem um yeah it's a bit messy but you can basically um prove that um explicitly thank you sir thank you okay thank you for joining with us so we have another question so uh, So how quantum spin liquid help us to hunt majorana fermions oh how how they help us to hunt majorana fermions well the point is that the quantum spin liquid is basically the phase out of which you can have majorana fermions um emerging here okay so think of basically um that these particles these majorana fermions they can't live outside for example this material alfortanium trichloride so this is the amazing thing which you for example see by my standard example of phonons so a phonon is an excitation that only is a property of the crystal okay so if you cut the crystal you have vacuum then you know the particle the phonon particle can't get out of this one and this is the very same thing so you need the spin liquid as the background and in this background the majorana fermion can live okay so you can't have uh 
um, the Mayolana family and without the spin liquid. Thank you, sir. This may be the last question. What is the quantum spin liquids? What is the quantum spin liquid? Yes. Okay, so this is this is I think easiest understood in, in, in something what it's not. Namely, you know that think of a regular letters, just think of a you know 2D square letters where you have a spin and they interact with each other. And the thing that you know is that you have a long-range ordered state. So think of a ferromagnet. All spins point in one direction if you are at sufficiently low temperatures. Yeah. So that would be a simple one. Then there is the second thing, a little bit more complicated, which is an antiferromagnet. You just take, you know, every second side, or you do like, you know, an A B sublattice partition, and you just put like all the spins up, down, up, down, up, down, alternatingly. So that's an antiferromagnet. Okay. And so now the spin liquid is a third non-trivial and highly correlated possibility where you now have a system of spins which down to lowest temperatures doesn't show any st um, strict ordering pattern like up down or you know any combination of those but instead what what uh, it is it is actually a large entangled soup of these spins and the easiest to think about this is in terms of these rvp states where now take always two spins which are next to each other and they form a singlet and then one spin liquid ground state for example would be a superposition of all possible of these singlet dimer coverings uh, and from that you see that it's a very weird state it doesn't have any long-range correlations if you measure correlation functions it's um, um doesn't have any long-range component but nevertheless and that's the key interesting thing is has long-range entanglement and this long-range entanglement is related to the underlying topological properties and then these weird excitations but um, you know in terms of just think of simple spin arrangements it's of course uh, much harder to picture than the standard ordered states so um, you know the, the take-home message is that you know apart from the conventional magnets that you that you know and learn about uh, in your studies there is a third exciting possibility which is really a system of you know, a huge entangled soup of spins which have really exotic properties and they appear at temperature. Yeah. So that's, you know, maybe a very short recap of what a spin liquid is. Thank you, sir. So uh, there's some requests from our students. So they're asking that if any of our students want to uh, do their higher studies in this field, what he or she need to do? Is there any fund in your university? So is there any opportunity for them to apply or for the po process to, uh, to to apply in your institute if any of our, our students want to uh, do do their higher studies in this field yes so i mean the the most important thing is that since you've seen that it builds upon a lot of um development in 20th century physics you know i think that the most important thing is to have good courses in things like statistic, uh, statistical mechanics um, and um, also things like critical phenomena um, and um, many body quantum mechanics. And, you know, if you're interested in this, um, you know, you can, for example, in your master choose to, to specialize in, in directions like that. So, you know, here at, at uh, my university in Munich, we have a really nice dedicated master program, which you can apply to. Um, in contrast to, you know, other um, Western systems, it's also, uh, you know, they are, it's relatively cheap. There are no high fees for that. And there you, we have a whole curriculum which uh, covers um, basic quantum mechanics, then many body quantum mechanics, quantum field theory. And then the main thing to end with this type of research is really statistical mechanics and uh, the theory of critical phenomena, which then um, in the end, goes into into these research topic which i've presented today thank you sir for your wonderful presentation and nice discussion session, sir we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the department of physics of my university of science and technology for accepting our invitation so it was a great webinar with you and i think students have a lot of have learned a lot of things about this uh, new particle and old material materials uh, hunting the major of fermions so thanks again and hopefully in near future we'll arrange another webinar with you Okay. Today, have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure also.